Example 4.4.8. Setup for this one says, you are saving for retirement. You would like to retire at age 65. You plan to make your last deposit into your retirement savings account on your 64th birthday and start withdrawing funds one year later on your 65th birthday. You would like your first withdrawal to be $80,000, and then you want the subsequent annual withdrawals to grow at 3% per year to maintain purchasing power after inflation. You expect to make your final withdrawal on your 100th birthday. You plan to run out of money and breath at the same time, which is all of our goals, I suppose. You estimate that your retirement savings will earn 7% while you are saving and during retirement while you are making withdrawals. How much must be in your retirement savings account immediately after making the final deposit on your 64th birthday to fund the retirement income? All right, we have got a time value of money problem. So we're going to use our three-step process where we're going to start in step one by mapping out the cash flows on a timeline, recording all the information from the problem there so that we can then use that timeline to identify the type of cash flow we're looking at. And then once we know the type of cash flow that we're looking at, we can select the appropriate tool with which to evaluate that cash flow. This one's got a little more going on with it than the other problems, but it's also a little more realistic setup than many of the problems we've looked at up until now. So we're starting to get into the realm of tools that we can actually apply to our lives and get some better outcomes for ourselves. All right, so let's start by mapping out these cash flows. This timeline is going to be a little bit different. It's going to start at zero, just like all of our timelines. That's going to be the beginning of the period we are evaluating. In this case, though, zero is not today. It's going to be the beginning of our retirement withdrawal timeline. So the period that we want to start with is our 64th birthday. That's when we're going to make the final deposit into our retirement savings account. And we need some sum to be saved at this point that we're going to be calling time period zero, even though it's in the future. We need some enough saved in this account so that we don't make any more deposits, but we can start making withdrawals. The first one being one year later on our 65th birthday when we're going to withdraw $80,000. And that's going to serve as our income for the year after that. And then one year after that withdrawal on our 66th birthday, we're going to make a withdrawal that is 3% larger. And that is 80,000 times 1.03 to make it 3% larger. So 80,000 times 3 is 24. So 8,000, 82,400. will be the size of our second withdrawal. And then that pattern is going to continue. So on our 67th birthday, or three years after we started withdrawing these funds, we're going to make another withdrawal that is again 3% larger. It's going to be 3% larger than the previous one. So if we do 80,000 times 1.03 squared, we'll get 80,000 grown by 3% twice. And so that third withdrawal is going to be 84,872. All right, and that pattern is going to continue out to our 100th birthday when we're going to make our final withdrawal, which will draw that account balance down to zero. And that is going to be, so 100 years of age, we started at 64. So that's going to be 36 total withdrawals. And the way we figure that out is by taking the age at the end of the timeline and subtracting the age at time period zero on our timeline. So age 100 minus age 64 is 36 total withdrawals. That starts counting the withdrawals at the end of the, at the first tick mark, the end of the first year, and includes the one all the way out to 100. Now the size of that last withdrawal is going to be 80,000 times 1.03. We had our first one here 
under the two tick mark, our second one that's squared here under the three tick mark. This one's under the 36 tick mark, so it will have grown 35 total times because the first one under the one tick mark is, is not grown at all, so it doesn't start counting here. The growth doesn't start counting until the second withdrawal. So the exponent on our growth factor here is one less than the tick mark that the cash flow appears under in this case. If we had started making withdrawals at time period zero, then the exponent on our growth factor would match the tick mark that it's under. In this case, it's lagging by one. Okay, so that last withdrawal, we'll go ahead and put an amount on that, although it turns out we won't necessarily need that to calculate this, but just to have a handle on the size of the cash flows we're talking about here. So 80,000 times 1.03 raised to the 35, that final withdrawal is going to be $225,108, and well, let's just call it $109. Okay, so that's the cash flow structure that we are looking at here. Step two is to identify what type of cash flow we're dealing with so that we can then select a tool to evaluate it. Well, we know we have growing cash flows. They're growing at a set rate, 3% in this case, throughout the timeline. They're happening at regular intervals, and there are only two types of cash flows that do that. There's either a growing perpetuity or a growing annuity. A perpetuity is a cash flow that goes on forever, it never stops. And in this case, we have a cash flow that actually stops. It's gonna, we plan for it to stop on our 100th birthday. We'll be out of savings at that point, so we'll be out of money. Um, and so this is a cash flow at regular intervals growing at a set rate that stops. It's a finite set of cash flows. Well, if you look at our cheat sheet, that exactly defines a growing annuity. Well, if I look at the annuities, there are three types of annuities under that section. There's the ordinary annuity, there is an annuity due, and then there are these, the growing annuity, which in this case, because I've, from the cheat sheet, I've selected the timeline from this example problem in the text, we actually have a timeline that matches exactly what we're looking at in this case, where we've got $80,000 beginning one period after we wanna find the present value of and continuing for 36 periods, which would be our 100th birthday in this case. Now we're a little bit limited on the tools that are available when evaluating growing annuities. The time value money keys on the financial calculator can't deal with a growth rate. So we're left with using either the growing annuity formulas or the spreadsheet. And just like the other videos for these examples, we're gonna skip over the spreadsheet solution and we're just going to focus on the formulas and time value money keys, which in this case means just looking at the formula because the time value money keys just aren't an option for this type of cash flow. Right, so the only question then is, are we calculating the present value of this growing annuity or the future value of this annuity? So if we look back at our problem, we are looking for how much must be in your retirement savings account immediately after making the final deposit on your 64th birthday to fund the retirement income. So we're looking for how much savings must we have right here on our 64th birthday at the beginning of this timeline in order to fund this retirement income that we wanna be able to draw down those savings and make these payments. So in this case, we're looking for the present value. We wanna take all of these future cash flows, discount them back to the beginning of the timeline at a, with a 7% discount rate because we think that's what we're going to be able to earn over the period that we're withdrawing these funds. So if we find the present value of each one of these cash flows using that 7% rate, then we will find how much we need to have saved on our 64th birthday in order to fund this particular income. All right, so we are dealing with a growing annuity And in this case, because we're dealing with a growing annuity, the only option we have available to us is the formula solution. All right, and the present value of a growing annuity is kind of an ugly formula. It's this guy right here, where we take the payment 
divided by the interest rate minus the growth rate, that's R minus G, where R is the interest rate as always, and then G is the growth rate in the cash flows. And then we multiply that times the quantity of one minus one plus G over one plus R, that whole thing raised to the N. So that is our payment. Our payment, in this case, we're looking for the present value at time period zero, and we're going to use the payment one period later. So the subscript on present value in this case is zero. The payment one period later is one. We're going to divide that by our interest rate minus the growth rate in our cash flows. And we are going to multiply that by the quantity, one minus one plus our growth rate over one plus the interest rate. That entire quotient is going to be raised to the number of compounding periods. All right, so let's plug in the information we actually have from this problem. That first payment or that first withdrawal in this example is going to be 80,000. Our interest rate is 7%, expressed as a decimal, that's 0 0.07. Our growth rate in the cash flows, we want them to grow at 3% every year. So 3% expressed as a decimal is 0 0.03. And we're going to multiply that by the quantity 1 minus 1 plus G. Again, our growth rate is 3%, expressed as a decimal is 0 0.03. So 1 plus 0.03 is 1.03. I'm going to go ahead and write that out to save myself typing it into the calculator. And then divided by 1 plus R, interest rate is 7%. 1 plus 0 0.07 is 1.07. I'm going to go ahead and write that out to save myself from typing in all the parentheses and addition in the calculator. And I'm going to raise that to the N. N in this case is the number of actual payments in this annuity. And there's potential for confusion here because we have two different counts here. We have the exponent on our growth factor, which in this case is 35. That does not match the number of payments because the first payment actually starts with a zero here, and the next one has a one. Like 1.03 1 raised to the one is just itself. 1.03 1 raised to the zero would just be one, so it's not here, it's just a one. It's 80,000 times one. So the exponent on that growth factor is not counting the number of cash flows. And that's a, an easy mistake to make is to pull the n off of the, um, the exponent on that growth factor, and that's not what we want to do. What we want to do is actually count the payments on our timeline really carefully by converting from the age to the actual number of payments. So 64 becomes the beginning of our timeline at time period zero. 100 is the end of our timeline. And so 100 minus 64 gives us 36 total payments, right? The first one is at the first tick mark here. The first payment is at the end of year one. So that's the first payment. Second payment is the 80,000 grown 3% and so on till we get 36 total payments. So what you're looking at for the N is the total number of payments. in the growing annuity. Okay, let's plug these guys into the calculator and see what we get. There's a lot of arithmetic going on here. There's a lot of tiny numbers we're dividing by and raising to the exponent. There's a lot of potential sources for mistakes. So I wanna be really careful here. This is one that I'm going to work in chunks and store the values as I go. And it's important to use stored values as we go because we can introduce some pretty significant rounding errors if we retype in any four decimal approximations. So I'm going to start by working left to right. I'm going to type in 80,000 divided by open parentheses 0 0.07 minus 0 0.03. Close the parentheses. It'll go ahead and do that subtraction for me. And then I'm going to press equals to get that value. And that guy is 2 million. And I'm actually going to store that on the one key. I know that's a nice even number, so storing it is not going to give me any more precision, but it is going to keep me from having to type in 2 million again. I can just say recall one and pour that and pull that number back up. All right, now I'm going to do the part within the brackets. 
and I'm actually going to handle this exponential function first. I could just type in the brackets as they are, but I tend to mess something up as I get towards the end. So I find it easier to start with the most complicated piece and kind of work my way back out. So I'm going to start by typing in 1.03 divided by 1.07 equals to go ahead and do that division, right? This is inside parentheses raised to an exponent. So this division needs to happen first before we raise it to an exponent. Okay, once that division is done, I need to raise that to the 36. So I'm gonna press Y to the X to say that I wanna raise this number to what I type in next, which is 36. Then I'll press equals for it to go ahead and raise that number to the 36. And then I need to take this number and subtract it from 1. I could store this number and then say 1 minus recall this value. If I don't want to do all that button pressing, the other thing that I can do is take this number, right? This 0.2537 is 1.03 divided by 1.07 raised to the 36. So it's this entire chunk. So I'm going to take this number and make it negative by pressing the plus minus key, and then I'm going to add 1 to it which is arithmetically equivalent to saying one minus that number. And I just find that that's fewer strokes on the calculator and less opportunities for me to make an error. There's no reason you have to work it like this. This is just the way that makes sense to me after messing up so many of these problems. All right, so I'm gonna store that guy on the two key. And notice we have a we have a very small value here, and it's not even. There's there's way more numbers beyond the 0.7463 that it's showing me. I just have the calculator set to show me four decimal places. So I'm going to use this stored value on here while it's on the display. Uh, well, let's just multiply the recall numbers and do it that way. Let's say recall one, which is the two million that I saved on there, times recall two. It has now pulled up that four decimal version, or that's what it's showing me. What it's actually pulled up is the 13 decimal version that it's now gonna multiply against two million, which is gonna give me a much different number than if I had just typed in 0.7463. We'll see that in just a second. So using the stored values, what I'm getting is the present value of 1,492,000. Point seven six. All right, now what that means is if I want to fund this retirement income, if I want to withdraw $80,000 at age 65, and then do that 36 times until I turn 100, with each payment being 3% higher than the last to cover inflation, then on my 64th birthday, when I make that final deposit in my retirement account, I need to have roughly let's call it, we're going to round it to 1.5 million. I need to have 1.5 million dollars saved in my account. And then once that happens, it earns 7% interest for one year. Then I can start withdrawing $80,000 per year and let that, the size of that withdrawal grow by 3% each year. And on my 100th birthday, when I make that final withdrawal of $225,109, I'll draw my account balance down to zero, and that'll be it. I'll be out of cash. Hopefully, uh, we'll run out of breath at about the same time we run out of money. Okay, let's look at what if I had just typed in this four decimal approximation instead of using a stored value. So if I say recall one, I take my two million times 0.7463. That looks exactly like what we did, but I just typed this in so it doesn't have the rest of the decimal places stored in there that I can't see, and I say equals, I come up with 1,492,600,000 1, even, so off by $4.24 roughly. Not a big deal with this type of problem, um, and that's because we don't, have, um, we don't have some of these smaller numbers raised to exponents like we do in some of the other formulas, but it's still not as precise as if we'd use stored values, and it's hard to know ahead of time if using that stored value is going to really matter or not in terms of the precision of our answer. So it's good to get in the habit of just using stored values as we go and make sure you get the most precise answer that you can.